Welcome to another episode of Be Kind Connects. I'm your host, Shabnam Islam. And joining us today is the iconic Dr. Joel Furman. Now, Dr. Furman is a board certified family physician, former world class figure skater, seven time New York Times bestselling author, and nutritional expert who has coined the ter term nutritarian as an eating method designed to reduce mortality and disease. Dr. Furman, it is an honor to have you on our show today. Thank you. Excited to be here today. So I'd like to start with the very beginning. Is it is it true that your interest in nutritional science began with the health issues of your father? That's right. I, in, as a child, as a teenager, I was reading all the health books and nutrition books, especially Dr. Shelton's works in the nineteen that he wrote in the nineteen fifties and sixties. And so, when was it that you actually decided to shift into veganism? Well, as a teenager, we cut back on animal product consumption. So we might, you know, as a, as a child, I was eating like regular, regular standard American diet. By the time I was 12 years old, we're having animal products maybe once a week or twice a week at the most, you know, where the family whole shifted. So it was a gradual shift over time where we eliminated animal products more and more, you know. And was your dad actually living with heart disease or cancer or particular disease that? Yeah, yes. Yeah. He was overweight and had kidney diseases and other issues that were interfering with his quality of his life. And so... Were all of the renal issues healed with moving towards a more whole food, plant-based? Yes, he moved. Yes, he moved to a whole food, plant-based diet. That's that's many, many years ago. It's it's what's interesting is that um, way before like the plant-based movement became so more popular and mo more known about, especially whole food, plant-based diet, the American Natural Hygiene Society was called. That's what the name was back then. Had conferences and people that were eating whole food, plant-based back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. So my father went to those conferences and, and started eating that way when, you know, back we're talking about, you know, like, I don't know, in 1960, 1969, you know, 1960. Before the, before the term vegan was even coined, really. Yeah, and, and, and then the American Vegan Society um, was started by the Dinshaws in, um, in Malaga, New Jersey. So in my practice for the, la you know, for the f last 40 years, I've seen a lot of, I've taken care of a huge amount of plant vegan eaters who are not eating junk food, vegan diets, but were eating very healthy whole food diets back from the back in earlier, many many years ago. So it became more popular today, but still there were groups doing it back then too. And so the the, the most fascinating thing with me here is that with the medical practice, going to medical school, you don't often get much education in nutritional science. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Right, you get them. Not it's what you get is worthless. It doesn't matter how much they give you; it's still worthless information. <laughs> <laughs> and so, how is it that you created a practice that was founded upon nutritional science um, when it wasn't something that you really learned in school? Well, I went to medical school with the specific intent to be a physician specializing in nutrition. My love and interest in nutrition, my passion, was there, and that's why I went to medical school um, with the expectation that getting a medical degree become a board certified and even going to an Ivy League medical school would all be an, an asset to do what I um, to do what I wanted to do which was somewhat outside the box when I um, when I pursued my medical my nutritional education and I lectured I became the chairperson of the nutritional education um, part of Me um, University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine um, when I pursued that and when I discussed it and worked and during medical school as like a an elective or the professors and teachers there used to say, we know you're right, um, but no, because I was like a, you know, the teacher, not the receiver of the information. I was the giver of the information. And they would say, we know you're right, but you're not going to get people to do that. Or we know you're right, but you're not going to make money that way. Or we know you're right, but, you know, um, it's not what people want to hear or you're not, you know, it's all, they always had an excuse. Why? You know? And my, my retort was always that it doesn't matter whether 1% of people will do it or whether uh, the eighty percent—that's irrelevant, because if we want to give people informed consent of the the best information, so they can make the choice for the tr to choose the trajectory of their life. Otherwise, that's contrary to the whole basis of good healthcare. So it was. So even back then in medical school, I was not going along with the with the, co the conventional thought, because they didn't disagree with me. They just thought they would like that it wouldn't be, mom, yes, wouldn't be something that would be viable or doable or get enough people to do it to support a practice that, you know whatever they so they were negative but they weren't against what I was doing and a matter of fact 
not only did he make me chairperson of the, of the nutritional education department, he also put me on the admissions committee of the school. And, and I was, um, and he also made me the 25 year um, keynote speaker at their 25 year reu reunion of the, of the medical school as well. But because a lot of the people in my medical school class would say to me that I affected their lives in such a positive fashion, more than a lot of what they did teachers at the medical school did. You know, um, a lot of the other um, students I was in class with. Matter of fact, they'd be going to my seat in the, in the theater where you'd get the lectures and they'd be hiding their candy bars and putting their... <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say, I'm not your mother, you know, you can do whatever you want. I'm not telling you when you... I'm not going to hide from me, I'm not going to... <laughs> That's so great. It's hilarious that, because that cognitive dissonance truly does exist with people, right? We we know what's good for us, and we but we still that behavior change is so hard to to implement, particularly when the culture of society has taught you this is the way we eat, this is the way we do, this is the way we practice. Because practicing isn't about prevention; it is about um, intervening with medication and with 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 surgery. And so I, I really love to talk about your new, your nutritarian diet and your health equation. Um, for those, for our VKind community who has not been exposed to Dr. Furman, he has a really great way to talk about how we should be eating. So would you mind sharing? Sure. I'm saying that the most proven methodology to slow aging and extend human lifespan, and we should be living to be 97 to 107 years old. So I'm saying the blue zones are not examples of maximizing human lifespan. They're, not, they're just a little better than what Americans do. So these five words are the critical words, and that's moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. So the five words are moderate caloric restriction with micronutrient excellence. And, we're, and I'm, what I'm saying here is that as you eat foods that do not contain micronutrients, and micronutrients are vitamins and minerals and, micro, and antioxidants and phytochemicals, and, and which are not really um, a significant load in animal products or processed foods. The colorful plants can the, be, um, contain the huge load of micronutrients, um, particularly phytochemicals that protect human immune function, slow aging, and arm the body to fight cancer and cell defects or cell breakage or cell or DNA or epigenetic changes or methylation defects are all defended against by our, by our part of our cells. A lot of the antioxidant response element is fueled by these phytochemicals and plants. And I always say that if, you, um, if you're not going to eat a substantial amount of green vegetables, then you can't have a normal immune system. You might as well live real close to a hospital because we're a green vegetable dependent animal. And green vegetables have the highest nutrient density, per, nutrient per calorie density of all food. And the calorie, calorie is also true. I'm saying the opposite is as you put in your body foods that do not contain a significant load of micronutrients, as you eat empty calories, processed foods, oils, you know, cheeses, meats, as you eat foods that just flood you with calories with no significant nutrient load, then you accelerate aging and create the foundation of inflammation and disease. And you do develop food addiction. Because, and, and people of all, the, the whole population is overweight and they can't control their desire for excess calories because they're deficient in nutrients and fiber. And you can't cut back on calories because the drive to overeat is too strong because they're not fueling the body with the not the body needs for nutrients. And I love that you say that because that gives me this follow-up question is, how does eating a whole food, plant-based diet actually impact satiety and hunger? What is the actual science behind um, That's a complicated question that I can answer over the next hour, but I'll try to summarize it. <laughs> Thank number you. Number one, number one, the, your body builds up um, toxic waste products and so a lot of those wastes are metabolic wastes, I mean, made by the body themselves, like free radicals, advanced glycation end products, um, urea, uric acid, ammonia, other. So the body builds up noxious waste products, as well as exogenous waste that come from the external environment, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, you know, plastic compounds that are endocrine disruptors, um, heavy metals. We get mold, we get exposed to toxins. And what I'm saying here is when you don't eat healthfully, the body builds up more metabolic waste products. And then your body tries to attempt to remove the backlog of waste in the more, and it more effectively does so in the non-feeding state or non-digestive state. So when you're eating, you're stopping detoxification and you feel better because detoxification when you're toxic can be uncomfortable 
and cause fatigue and headaches and stomach cramping, anxiety. So people feel agitated or fatigued and they have to eat to keep their energy up. And that's a sign because when they're not digesting, their body is circulating more metabolic waste products for removal. The liver particularly deconjugates fat-soluble toxins and makes them water-soluble for excretion in the urine. And the liver is actively involved in detoxification with the kidney, um, but it can't do that, what, effect, that if, very effectively while you're eating and digesting food. So what I'm saying right now, like smoking another cigarette makes you feel better from caffeine, from nicotine withdrawal, and having another cup of coffee makes you feel better from caffeine withdrawal, that eating more food makes you feel better from unhealthy food withdrawal. And people have, because the food is addicting and has withdrawal symptoms that people have to overeat to feel okay. They have to eat more calories than they require because they don't feel well in the catabolic phase of the digestive cycle when they're not digesting food anymore. But there's other elements involved in that because concentrated calories make, you, make the um, apostat center in the brain dopamine insensitive. So you require more calories just to feel normal. You get acclimated to excess calories, just like you get acclimated to smoking cigarettes, so that you don't have the excess calories, you feel empty. And you need more concentrated calories, you need that flood of calories that are in the blood, like oils and sweets and meats and cheeses, the more concentrated calories, because um, sugar and white flour has something in co common with oil and meat. Because sugar and white flour enter the bloodstream with a huge caloric load at one time that you couldn't meet, you couldn't get that load of calories in the blood if you ate an apple or a piece of papaya or some strawberries or some quinoa or some beans, you couldn't, or some nuts, the calories would inch into the bloodstream more slowly. When you have white flour, honey, maple syrup, or, or, or um, sugar, the calories flood the body, body very rapidly and you can get a huge load of calories to affect the brain. And the person becomes desirous of that caloric rush. The same thing with oils. Walnut oil compared to walnuts, olive oil compared to an olive, like avocado oil. When you use oil, you can flood the bloodstream with a huge amount of calories, and people get addicted to this huge caloric load in the, in the blood, and they don't feel satisfied without it. An apple doesn't satisfy them. They have to eat something sweeter, like right. fried meats. You know, just, just an apple or a peach is not adequate. They have to have a whole box of something, you know, like candy bars or something. But, the, um, but what I'm saying here is that most Americans are acclimated to concentrated calories if they get um, essentially addicted to it because they don't feel well unless they overly hit their bloodstream. And I'm saying also that the most Americans and people in the modern world get all their fat intake from animal fats and oils. And I'm saying the a nutritarian gets their fats from nuts and seeds, which have a different biological effect. The calories are absorbed more slowly over hours, not over minutes. So it doesn't rev up fat storage hormones and your body could preferentially burn those fat calories for energy instead of immediately storing them as fat and stimulating um, and being an appetite stimulant. So oil is an appetite stimulant as well. And as you can imagine, um, you know, many vegans are overweight too from pouring oil on their food. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. And could be eating sweets and, and processed carbohydrates and muffins and cakes and pizzas and all kinds of things, you know, vegan versions of all the junk food. And and really, we we can't instill global or, or international change, domestic change in this country until we really truly have governmental influence. And this is where I really want to talk about the comparative values of the USDA's former food guide pyramid. You know, now they've transitioned it to my plate, but I'd love to talk about the nutritarian food guide pyramid in comparison to the former USDA food guide pyramid. You know, because according to the USDA's evidence of their 2022 of, uh, dietary guidelines, they even said eight out of 10 Americans still find information conflicting on what it is that they're told to eat. And we're spending billions of dollars on type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and the foods we're eating continue this vicious cycle. So how specifically does yours differ compared to theirs? And... Well, veg vegetables are at the base of my pyramid, not grains, for sure. And then we want the diet to be predominantly from the prime of the carbohydrates and fats to come from um, vegetables, starches, beans, and the fats from nuts and seeds, and, and fresh fruit, and our sugar sweets to come from fruit, not from sugar. And we can even make desserts out of fruit. As you know, you could whip up frozen fruit, you could put in, you know, bananas and macadamia nuts and vanilla bean powder and make banana, I make um, vanilla ice cream, you can make all delicious, um, delicious desserts without adding sweeteners to them, just by adding the, the fruits of the frozen fruits. And, but in any case, um, 
the most significant finding from the scientific literature of the last decade has been that diets higher in animal protein lead to more premature deaths in a dose-dependent manner. More animal protein, more early life deaths in a dose-dependent manner. And I think that that's not yet been, rec been represented by the pyramid or my plate because people still in this country think the word protein means animal products. And even though they recognize that fat, saturated fat from animal products may be not, not so great, they still want to go lean meat and the white meat, chicken and fish. They see that animal egg whites, that animal protein is a favorable nutrient. And I'm saying that's not what the evidence shows. We have a tremendous amount of corroborated evidence today that show that increasing animal protein makes for short lifespan. While at the same time, the same studies and studies done at the same time, we're talking about large scale studies with many hundreds of thousands of people done by different researchers around the world showing the same information. And that is that more plant protein in the diet leads to a longer lifespan. What does more plant protein in the diet mean? That means not a, not a macrobiotic diet of rice or not a diet of mostly fruit. Or not a, it means a diet of high protein plant foods, which mean green vegetables, beans, the high protein grains like quinoa and nuts and seeds. That beans, nuts and seeds and green vegetables, that vegetables, beans, nuts and seeds uh, definitely enable humans to extend human lifespan. And we have more than probably 20 different um, high quality epidemiologic studies that show that nuts and seeds when, as a source of fat extends human lifespan, reduces heart attack risk by about 40% and reduces cancer risk by about 30%. That's reducing risk in people who follow a, a, a standard diet still eating animal products. The inclusion of nuts and seeds not even is a, is a dramatic lifespan advantage for a person not even vegan. So we're saying here that um, in the Seventh day Adventist studies, of course, studying flexitarians, near vegans, people eat animal products once a week, or vegans, you show a significant enhanced life, increase in lifespan in vegans eating nuts and seeds compared to those low-fat vegans not, not eating nuts and seeds. Even, and the, and the nut-eating vegans live longer than the, than the um, you could say the flexitarians, those with occasional animal product intake who are eating nuts and seeds on a whole lived longer than the vegans who weren't eating, are not eating nuts and seeds and trying to be on a low-fat diet. So one of the major flaws in the, in the and some of the vegan information published in the last few decades are people who are trying to keep the fat as low as possible and trying to avoid nuts and seeds in their diet, which is not a, something favorable for, for prom promoting human lifespan and facilitating the absorption of anti-cancer phytochemicals. And that's what I was going to ask. I, I've heard uh, differing evidence saying that eliminating oils is the best way to create longevity. But um... Yes, eliminating oils. Yes, I agree with that but not nuts and seeds. So it's important to dif differentiate between the two. There's a completely different biological effect from having a walnut compared to walnut oil, right? So walnut oil it is 100% is of is the calories are absorbed instantaneously, and it promotes overeating. It's an appetite stimulant, and the body stores it as fat immediately, turning on fat storage hormones. Whereas the walnuts are absorbed over many hours, and they're not all biologically absorbed. Some of the fats pass through into the toilet bowl, and they're absorbed so slowly the body can preferentially burn them for energy, as opposed to storing them in fat without turning on fat storage hormones. So the so we the um, nut and seeds calories act as a normal calorie, well, while oil calories and sugar calories are not normal calories. They cause excessive fat. They're they're appetite stimulants. They lead to overeating, and it's not just the extra calories people are consuming, but they actually um, make it more difficult to lose weight. The average woman today, compared to a woman 40 years ago, is 30, who eats the same amount of calories they did 40 years ago, is 30 pounds heavier today on the same calories and same exercise amount as they would have been 40 years ago because of these hormonal effects and endocrine disruptors and toxins in the food and supply that makes the body hold on to more weight when you have more toxic um, waste products in your body. It's harder to lose weight. So we want to get a high consumption of these nutrients that enable the body to remove toxins um, remove metabolic waste products, and then you can body can get rid of the fluid and the and the fat that's diluting the acidity and the irritability of the tissues. I love that, and, and, and but I do want to go back to the food the 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 nutritarian food guide pyramid because I think on the USDA USDA food guide pyramid we also write to to consume things sparingly, and and you write on yours. Um, it allots for approximately 10% of calories to come from eggs, oil, fish, wild or naturally raised meat and dairy. Now, is the inclusion of this on the on the nutritarian food guide pyramid 
in hopes to eventually shift people to a fully plant-based diet or to be realistic in the fact that not everybody's going to be completely vegan or um, even though we know the evidence of eating this is probably not really beneficial longitudinal. Correct. Even one serving of meat a week, for example, is a significant risk, increases risk of heart attack. If you're looking at that nutritarian pyramid, I, I think you're looking at one of my earlier works, maybe mm-hmm. written 15 years ago or something. I don't think that nutritarian pyramid has been used much in, recent, in the recent decade, and certainly my latest book, Eat for Life, um, over the years. So you're right. Back when I wrote Eat to Live in 2004, I had a nutritarian which allowed... Um, when a person followed the six-week plan, after six weeks, they made the diet less strict and started to dabble and be able to have something that wasn't so healthy added to their diet if they ate 90% healthfully. But I, number one, I never felt that was optimal. It was always a compromise to, um, for people to as a starting point. But number two, over the last, you could say over the last 20 years, we've seen that people dabbling in sheets and a little bit of animal product, a little bit of oil, a little bit of junk food, a little bit of this. It fuels their des- their addictive desires to e- eat. It leads to more recidivism, more yo-yoing their weight, more weight, weight harder to follow a diet, not easier to follow it. It makes for um, worse long-term outcomes than people who jump in with with a more radical dietary change. So, making a big radical statement here, I'm saying that my experience has been over the last 20 years is that people dabbling and doing this, you know, with, who wanted to cheat all the time, especially when they're overweight food addicts. It just keeps their um, decision making and desire for it, it keeps uh, the flame lit under the desire for those foods, and it keeps them wanting more and more. And they're always stressed out, deciding what to eat, whether they should be eating healthy or not eating un- unhealthy, and triggered by by all kinds of events that trigger them to eat those things. But once you've made the firm decision to go 100% and cut them out completely, it's less stress. You lose your desire for those foods over time. You build back more taste muscle. And the chance of recidivism and re- reigniting your addictive drives to want to eat that stuff and gain weight back is much more is much better controlled and minimized. So I don't think that I'm an advocate of my old nutritarian pyramid anymore either, which allowed maybe a little bit of more cheating at the top. You know, I love that. Thank you for addressing that. And yes, I was I was referring to the old Eat to Live uh, 2004 pub- publication. But I think what you do is phenomenal and i think people need to know about your eat to live retreat in in san diego um and how you have really changed lives with this live-in residential program can you share a little bit about this right we have a live-in residential program that's a minimum of 30 days but a lot of people stay two to three months or four months and um and my um, rationale for starting and of course it's 100 percent organic we grow our own lettuce, bok choy, fruits. I'm actually serving bananas and kumquats and all kinds of foods grown on the premises. Even have, you know, um, so it's really super exciting. I love the fact that, oh, look at this. I picked this today and I grew it out of our own garden, this bok choy with the um, with the drizzle of um, like of, of tart cherry juice. It was all made right here on the premises. But anyway, so we're teaching people to retrain their taste buds, to learn how to make healthy foods taste great. And they drop, you know, a lot of weight. They drop maybe um, you know 20 pounds the first month or 15 pounds the second month, but they the whole purpose is learning how to reproduce this when they go home, and to get rid of their addictive drives to overeat and to eat wrongly. So they learn that this is the way they prefer to eat, so they can stick with it. And we have a lot of information we teach on emotional overeating and how to view the world and get more pleasure out of life in general. And and so we a lot of mindful behavior, and that affects food addiction. So we have essentially food addiction counseling and specialists here. So it, um. So people leave here maybe having lost some weight, but they continue to lose and enjoy living this way when they go home. That's the whole objective of coming. Whereas a person go to a, another type of health facility for a week or two, and they lose some weight and eat healthier, but they go home and don't follow that way of eating and go back to their old way of eating again, they gain the weight back. What was the point of even going? Absolutely. So I wanted to do something a little different and make, make a longer term stay um, available for people with the right information so they can really benefit for the rest of their life from coming here. And the right team. You have a comprehensive team from, um, you have nutritionists, you have you have chefs, you have people that are there to help people exercise, incre- increase their well-being. So it, it truly is a comprehensive program. Yeah, it's fun too. We also left next to a thousand acre park with hiking trails and we have a sand volleyball court, a pickleball court and a saltwater pool. and a, It's just a lovely place to be and uh, it's just a um, great um, atmosphere for people to heal. And we also do some um, reparative joint work here too. So in other words, um, I have a 
a soft wave, it's an extracorporeal shock wave. It's called the soft wave TRT machine. Mm -hmm. And so we do some things to heal people with, you know, frozen shoulder or back issues or knee problems. And I look at people's feet and get their feet aligned in neutral alignment so they can walk better. And as they're losing weight, we're trying to improve their structural fine function of their body in, in, a, in a more, um, you know, in an alignment type way. So they have no to get knee pain and ankle pain and hip pain and back pain. So we're trying to help them be able to be more active as well and feel better. So they're getting healthier, getting rid of their musculoskeletal injuries and getting better aligned while they're here and, um, and, ex and taught how to exercise properly, properly have right, the right kind of posture. You know, so we're, we're doing a lot of things that helps their body as well as their mind and their eating and their food. So when they leave there, they're really um, feeling much better. And they have a community. So now that they're not alone to doing this together, they have a community that they can have an accountability partner, I think, that uh, holds for a longer success. Right. Yeah, and I have a lot of um, services on my website where I give people community and support and videos and, and com forums and discussions and things. But the, the retreat certainly is an option for people. I know it's, it's not an option for many people because it's, you know, it's more expensive. But for people who really need it, they're so grateful. I have, they're so... Um, it's really grateful and it's tremendously rewarding for me. My wife and I, as like a semi-retirement project, just love doing this because we really love still interacting with people and not just, you know, not just stopping my practice and doing and just talking or speaking or writing, but I want to actually interact with people and help them get well, get them off their medications. And it's really just very rewarding changing their life. Get, their asthma goes away, their headaches go away, their joint pains go away. Their psoriasis is gone. Their heart disease. Their diet off their diabetic medication. No other blood pressure drugs. So it's just to, you know deep prescribing, unprescribing or deep prescribing, getting them back healthy again, and um, and giving them the knowledge and the and the experience and the psychological help that they needed to really transform their lives to the better. You're an amazing things, Doc, and we're really appreciated of it. And what I really like to hear, what I really like that you're sharing about is that you know it is about eliminating toxic elements from from your body or from your diet that that is is creating greater morbidity and mortality so what with the increase of uh with the increase in popularity of intermittent fasting i really love to hear your perspective on fasting and health and you've even published a book fasting and eating for health and even published an interesting case study on water only fasting to uh impact the management of psoriatic 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 arthritis. I'm sorry. Arthritis. Yes, yes. And um, some other autoimmune conditions. Yeah, and I, so I'd love to hear a little bit about your fi findings on that and your perspective on fasting. I think fasting is an effective therapeutic tool that is in the in the toolbox to help people with serious conditions, particularly asthma and lupus. And you know, it's it's when you have a person eating healthfully, and you want to tip them over to be able to get off their drugs and get well, fasting can be utilized, you know, conservatively and appropriately to help people. I don't recommend fasting water fasting or extended water fasting, juice fasting, or even intermittent fasting to a certain degree for people who are overweight food addicts. Because when you cut their calories back too far, they become more obsessed with food and it slows the meta excessively slows the metabolic rate. And then they become more likely to gain the weight back again and you just use fasting as a, as a weight, another yo-yo diet that they use to yo-yo the weight up and down, which is not good for the long-term health. So um, what I'm saying is my experience and plus the um, research over the last, um, more, last decade has been that, and probably there's not many people I think who've had as much experience in this arena as I have, because I've actually been in the, in the, you know, seeing patients my whole life and seeing, you know, thousands of, tens of thousands of, of individuals. And that when they're a, a food person with, with the struggles with, with their diet, with their weight and with dietary control, and you put them on a fast to get results or even cut their calories back too, too far, even go for lower than a thousand calories a day to try to accelerate weight loss, or even with intermittent fasting, giving it, they, it, it, it often triggers their desire to binge. And after fasting, their metabolism is even slower, and the binges lead, lead to further weight gain. And look at all those people who've lost weight from fasting and, see, and view their health and weight two years down the road. And because that's what you have to do to see if it's valuable. And two years down the road, they've gained the weight back and then some and more weight. They've not kept the weight off. Uh, this is why we want to keep people to learn how to, with the repetition of eating right and learning the recipes and keeping your calories in that moderate caloric restricted window between 1,200 and 1,600, based on individual, for, let's say for an average woman, is between around 13 to 1,400 calories a day for weight loss. We're teaching them how to eat a great tasting diet within a favorable caloric window 
that they can maintain and lose two pounds a week, two to three pounds a week ongoing for, to, for the whole, for, and stay with the diet for the rest of their life to keep themselves slim and healthy, as opposed to restricting calories too far when they start and they go back the other way and bounce back the other way. And then the 1,300 calories or 1,400 calories causes weight gain because they cut their calories back too far and slowed it down. Now, that doesn't mean I don't use fasting in, with some cases with certain conditions, but these then that person is, is not an overweight food addict, and they're not going to utilize it the same way. And they've eaten healthfully for a long period of time. I've gradually tapered their drugs, and I'm getting to the point where I can get them off their steroids or their last medications, and I might use fasting to help me get over that little hump at the end so the asthma doesn't flare up again. And I do recommend the type of intermittent fasting called time-restricted eating, eating where you don't eat food after six o'clock at night or after five o'clock at night. I do recommend, I do strongly recommend people not eat before they, right before they go to sleep, that they eat earlier in the day and they allow at least four to five hours of digesting before they go, so they're, they go to sleep on, a, on an empty stomach, not on a full stomach, because that's a lifespan enhancing tool. Some people may call that intermittent fasting, but it's really not fasting. It's just um, eating, at the, eating when it's light out instead of eating when it's dark out. And some people may call it time-restricted eating, but it's we know now that it's not healthy to eat late at night. Um, it's not, because you heal and detoxify and repair. The anti-aging phenomenon goes on, and even weight loss goes on most effectively when you sleep at night. And the effectiveness of the body's own miraculous self-healing mechanisms that are enhanced with sleep and rest are deterred or inhibited when you have when you're digesting food at the same time. So you want to get the most benefit from your sleep. You shouldn't be digesting a big meal when you're sleeping. And you just dropped so much great information because what I believe is what you're saying is that this is just the way to live no matter what type of population you are. If you're living with disease, if you are overweight, or even if you're an athlete, correct? Right. You're saying that you can still increase longevity and impact athletic performance with living a nutritarian diet. Yes, that's the key. And many professional and Olympic athletes have been doing that and are doing it and have done it. So I've, I've had the opportunity to... So, and, and a lot of them don't do it to increase athletic performance. They do it to increase athletic performance longevity so they can still compete and enter the, and, and continue their athletic power, have a, be athletically competent as they age and not age as fast and to not get sick and not to get sick all the time and miss their events or miss the training. And so they, you know, so I have a lot of you know, people who've... Um, I've advised a lot of professional world-class athletes to improve their career, sustain a longer career, because they because they're so they eat so carefully. Well, thank you, Dr. Furman. I really appreciate your time and and sharing your knowledge with us today on Be Kind Connects. My pleasure. A lot of fun. And that wraps up this edition of Be Kind Connects with the magnificent Dr. Joel Furman. To learn more about his nutritarianism, his public his published works and his Eat to Live retreats in sunny San Diego, please go to www.drfurman.com. And thank you for watching this episode of Be Kind Connects and for your continued support to expand the veg economy. And I'll see you next time.